thank you for coming on the platform. Uh, I truly appreciate you, the work that you done put in and the work that you're going to, you know, continue to do. I definitely look forward to it. I know you got to make some moves, so we're going to kind of jump right into it. Um, welcome to the show, Ken. Thank you, man. I appreciate you having me. Oh, yeah, yeah. no doubt. It's an honor. For the viewers who may not recognize you, um, let them know who you are and definitely where you're from. So uh, I'm Ferrari Shepard. Um I'm a professional contemporary artist. Uh, I was born in Chicago, uh, grew up in New York, uh, went to School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I've done quite a bit of bouncing around the world um, in the short time that I've been here, relatively short time. Uh, I've lived on the continent, several countries in Africa, um, Zanzibar, South Africa, Ethiopia, um, and currently I reside in Los Angeles, California. Yeah. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. I'm in Ghana right now. So, you know, we just had like a okay. big, uh, like an internet shortage. So some things is kind of slow. So if we get, you know, disconnected or it uh, frees up or anything, you know, the stream yard to keep recording. Yeah, I um, yeah, I definitely know about you know that life and <laughs> where sometimes there's outages and you know you just gotta deal with it. Yep. How long oh, yeah, you been out oh, there yeah. in Ghana? Uh, I got in Ghana in January, but I was in Uganda and Tanzania, so I've been to like twenty African countries. I lived in South Africa for a year, so I, my my goal is to live in Africa permanently. But I kind of want to visit because Africa got like almost 60 different countries, you know what I'm saying? And they all different. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, you know what's crazy is uh when my assistant uh showed me, you know, your interest in doing doing the podcast, uh man, I was like, this dude reminds me of myself, you know? Because before I was known as an artist, uh I had a I had a blog. This was way back in the day. It was called Stop Being Famous. And um it was sort of, you know, the same, same, uh, same vibe, but, um, and then I lived in different African countries. I was like, man, I got to do this interview because, you know, you're on the right path and I just could feel the good energy that's coming from your movement, you know? Man, man, I truly appreciate that. Yeah, I was checking out your profile. They were saying you was, you was a journalist at one time. I'm like, dang, that's, that's, that's dope for real. And I, I got to yeah. ask you, like, Growing up, how did you, you know, get involved in all? Because you're like a multi-talented person. You do the journalism, you do the art, you're doing music. Where did all this begin? Right. So I've always been an artist ever since the, ever since I've known myself. Um, when I was in kindergarten, uh, I kind of, I guess I excelled a, a lot. You know, uh, my mother, at least she tells me that. And um I was my first show actually was at the Art Institute of Chicago when I was in kindergarten. They had a call out for um for for kids who are artists or whatnot, and then they put us on display for however long. I guess it was a month or something like that. Um, and I continue, you know, ex exploring art uh, throughout high school. You know, it's a little harder for me because at the time. Um, you know, I grew up during the crack epidemic and I was in housing projects. So, um, you know, there was a lot of distractions uh, going on, to say the least, in terms of just being a young black man and uh, trying to survive the, the, the violence and the, from the police and otherwise, you know. So uh, art, art became kind of a, a refuge for me where, um, you know, Actually, I, I was a troubled kid, so I don't even know how I made it out of high school because I ditched class so much, not advocating that to kids because, you know, but I was a troubled youth. And um, but the only class that I really came to school for was was art, like painting, you know, so that was the last two periods. Uh, so it would be seventh to eighth period and I would just stay there until they put me out of the school, you know, and um, I just remember really being excited about trying new techniques, uh, 
and it would just be burning in my head at, all night. Like, I can't wait to get to school tomorrow so I could try this new thing, you know? And uh, it was then in high school where I started winning awards. And, you know, for a kid that's in the hood, like, that that means everything because it's somebody saying that you're gonna, that you have something special. Uh, and... Um, So my art teacher at the time, it was a, a, a teacher, her name was Mrs. Sokoloff, uh, this Jewish woman who was really cool. She was like a mother figure to a lot of us who was going through just problems, you know. She helped me uh, get into the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Like she helped me put together my portfolio and all of that. So I ended up getting a, um, a merit scholarship and uh, a presidential scholarship. So... You know, I attended school at the Art Institute. I remember it like it's yesterday because it was a it was a bit of a um, culture shock. Uh, I had I grew up around like basically like Puerto Ricans, Black people, Dominicans. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have many uh, Asian or white friends. Uh, so to go to th this prestigious art school, it was yeah, like I said, it was a culture shock. But I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, that started me on my kind of, on my journey, or at least I thought at that time on my journey towards an art career. Um, but what I later found out was that, you know, although the school or the art institute or any, any art school that you go to or any school for that matter is good for teaching you how to communicate and how to think critically, it doesn't necessarily help you in any career endeavor. You know, like I would ask some of my professors, you know, this is all cool, like all of these theories and art history. I'm like, how do I apply this to real life and um, and make a career? You know, and most, I mean, most, if not all the time, none of my professors had the answer. And, and you know, later I found out it's because they didn't know themselves, you know, like if they knew how the art world functioned, uh, they could they would be in it and they wouldn't be teaching, you know, not to disrespect any professor or anything, but I'm saying like, that's the, that's the idea that I had at the time, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, so I left the school of the artists to, I dropped out in my fourth year because I can no longer afford it. Uh, my, 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 um, my uh, scholarships had run out and I was getting all these loans and everything. And it just, you know, it just didn't make sense for me financially to continue down that path. Um, so I dropped out and uh, I started selling weed, <laughs> started selling weed. Uh, don't do that either, kids. But I mean, if you do it, don't get caught. Um, and that kind of allowed me to you know, to, it freed me up to work on my practice. And I, I attempted to become a professional artist at that time. I uh, showed at different places, you know, some places in New York and, and Chicago. <clears throat> and um, uh, people would come to the show and they would basically eat the cheese and drink the wine and then they would leave. They wouldn't buy anything, you know, and I just couldn't understand it. I was like, you know, I'm not, what am I doing wrong here? And I didn't understand I needed to build a foundation and to build a portfolio and to get my name out there and everything. But I remember at that time, I think, you know, I was in my early 20s. I said, I, maybe I need to step away from visual art and um, get my name somewhere else, try something new. And at that time, it was uh, it was kind of the dawn of uh, social media and um and also the death of the print magazine and print publication. So the internet was definitely taking over. And I had this idea for uh, a magazine and it, you know, the name Stop Being Famous popped in my mind because it was partially how I felt in a, in a way that, you know, it was a tongue in cheek critique of, you know, celebrity culture and whatnot. Um, but, uh, I modeled my persona or myself around uh, a journalist who was active in the 60s and the 70s, or maybe more just the 60s, but his name was Lester Baines, and he used to write for Rolling Stone magazine. And what made him special was that he became sort of a, 
cult icon himself as a figure because he whether he's interviewing you know Mick Jagger or Bob Dylan it didn't matter like he was he was kind of like not he seemed to be in, uninterested or impressed with their celebrity he wanted to know more about who they were as a person and he would critique that you know so that's how I modeled the um the the interviews that I did around and it just kind of that caught it caught on like wildfire like I had this website that I built myself and it was kind of it was kind of quirky and you know it got to the point where PR companies started reaching out to me and telling me that you know so and so has a new movie coming out or this person has an album coming out or whatever it may be and I would be on the job you know the only thing that I did that for about eight years the only thing that stopped that was that I was unable to find a way at that time to monetize. You know, I had people helping me and, you know, they were doing it on the strength because they just was like, we really, you know, love the idea and the concept and it's it had clout at that time. But I knew like it just became, it came, became harder and more, it became more apparent that uh, it would be challenging to monetize. I tried throwing events and parties so that was kind of my exit, but that actually led me to everything else that would happen, happen in my life. You know, I became a journalist in that I started to write um, these op-ed pieces for Stop Being Famous, and they became popular to the point where, like, The Nation and Huffington Post and these different um, publications, they wanted me to start writing for them, Uh on the, on the subjects of po political, uh, geopolitical things. And I actually was uh, sent to, you know, conflict zones like Middle East and uh, the West Bank. Yeah, and um, which was a serious ordeal, you know, it was really serious. But um, yeah, it, it came a time though where I think that, you know, when you're young, you think you could do everything that you ever want to do, you know, and you do think that you have unlimited time. And to a degree, that's a good attitude to have. Uh, but, you know, that it comes to a point where you just have to focus and say, well, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? And, you know, with the with the war correspondence and the seriousness of a geopolitical uh, landscape, like I knew that that wasn't anything I wanted to do for the rest of my life. What I really wanted to do was... Um, be a painter, you know, and it took me one more career iteration to really realize that, you know, throughout my journalism, I I, I became friends with Yassine Bey, Mos Def, we became creative partners, end up being in a musical group with him called December 99th. We put out one album on title and I realized I didn't want to be a musician. <laughs> you, know what I'm saying? you know, it was like, that was the dream that I had when I was young. But, you know, I fulfilled it and then I realized I'm like, you know, no way do I want to be 40 and still navigating this uh, abusive uh, industry because the music industry is the most abusive industry that I've ever encountered. Uh, so, you know, just trial and error, man, you know, as a young man trying to find himself uh, and... I finally made it around to becoming a visual artist and which wasn't easy at all, you know. Um but nothing worth having is worth is is easy to get. Oh yeah, man. I appreciate you sharing that, man. You dropped so many, you know, gems, man. I'm still yeah. trying to process everything that you were saying. Um, man, what was it like, you know, if it's okay to ask you, you know, going to these different countries and know they got a war going on or they got a conflict but then you coming from the the shy the midwest you know the, the reputation that they have i'm from cleveland so i know but right how, right how does that affect you as a, just a person and the an artist and a journalist you know so like because I, I these two cities that i call myself like a shy yorker you know these two cities they couldn't be more different than each other you know it's, it's certain similarities but like new york and chicago have a totally different culture um even though new york is trying to act not trying to i'm not don't say it, starting to act like chicago in terms of like the gang culture and everything because like in the ninth early 90s and 90s wasn't too much it was 
very little gang activity, you know, but Chicago is a different animal, you know, like I've seen so much violence and uh, I've been shot at on five different occasions. Thank God that, you know, I made it through. Um, uh, so I think that when you experience that level of violence and tension, um, not only does it traumatize you, but it, uh, it, I think that it numbs you to a large degree. Um, and so being in a conflict zone felt, uh, unfortunately it was very extremely familiar, you know, not only that, but the oppressive, there was certain oppressive regimes out there that, um, you know, I was accustomed to growing up, um, where I grew up, where it's like, as a young black man, you don't, you don't, you don't belong anywhere. Like, you know, you walk it down the street, you're at the, you're at the park, you're at the gym, you whatever. You're not supposed to be the police. Say, get out, get out of here. What you doing? Let me get your name. Blah, blah, blah. You say, what the, like, I'm a young person. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, go hide under my bed? Like, you know? Uh, so it's really a, a second class citizenry, you know? Um, so I, I was, I was, I, that was extremely familiar to me, you know? So I think that's why I was able, wherever I am in the world, I'm able to, uh, not to say I've never been afraid, you know, I think fear is healthy and it's a sign that you uh, are alive and that you want to be alive, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but whether it's the townships outside of Cape Town or wherever, like I have a good radar for street radar for trouble and, you know, to understand, you know, just to respect respect um people in their position and where they are in life you know you don't go fly and wear all of this jewelry going to brazil you know certain areas of brazil or going you know what i mean like it's disrespectful to do that because there are people who you know who don't have shoes so you know what's the message that you're sending to them if you if you don't respect that so I was able to navigate and I had a great, you know, my experience, those four, four and a half years that I lived on the continent was some of the greatest uh, of my life. At the time I was, you know, I was with my brother uh, from another mother, most deaf, Yassine Bay, and we were exploring the continent together. You know, he's about 10 or some, maybe 11, some years older than me. So he's like a bigger brother. Uh, so, you know, he was he was also learning and growing, too, along with me, you know, and um, there was a time where I felt like I wanted to completely just live in on the continent and, um, you know, thinking about it in a logist from a logistical standpoint, like I realized how difficult that really is. Like you have to have your uh, your paper together, you know, you got to be, you know. Your money got to be right. You know, you have to have no debt in the U.S. really because you're going to be beholden to the to the, to the tax man. Um, so it's really, you know, you have to have a plan. So, um, yeah, but I, I think that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, if it's all right, I want to ask you a little bit more about the, De uh, the December 99th project because... Mm -hmm. um, Man, just to be able to even, how can I say, even even meet most deaf because y'all yeah, seen Bay, I should say, um, that's some people's favorite MC on the planet mm -hmm. Earth. Now you only, like you say, you got to establish a relationship with them, make music with them. Like, how did you go from just making music to connecting with him? I know you was doing a journalism thing, but was was you always yeah, making like, beats prior to that, or you just nah, started so, at that time? Yeah. Um, so uh basically he wrote he reached out to me via email, you know, and he was like, Man, I'm a fan of the stuff you do. And he was like, I want to build with you. And at that time I was kind of confused. I'm like, do you want me to like interview him or like what? You know, so we got we hopped on the phone and um, you know, we just we just clicked, man. From that moment on, we stay on the phone for like four hours, just you know laughing and talking and being like, yo, blah, blah, blah. So I actually was invited to uh, this conference in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, at the African Union. And um, I, I invited him. You know, I asked them if it was okay if he came and they actually provided 
for him to come with his mother at that time, Umi, rest her soul. Uh, and, you know, we met on the streets of Ethiopia on, in Addis Ababa uh, at the Friendship Hotel, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then we were inseparable, basically, because it was like a, I finally found someone who had a like mind with me, same business, you know, in terms of what we want to do in, the, in, in terms of business. Um, and... Um, yeah, we went about it. That was the thing. He didn't know. He didn't know I made music because I really didn't take myself seriously as a musician. Because I used to just, I would make beats and play instrument because I play all the instruments. But it was like just something that I did to pass the time. And you know, he actually heard one of the one of the beats that I had. He was like, "Yo, who is that?" And I'm like, "That's me." And from that moment on, we started recording. And then we looked around. We had a whole album. And um, you know, for me, it was like. It was an extension of my artistic practice. Like, so I didn't view it like I love all sorts of music, like ranging from obviously rap, but you know, from uh, alternative and punk rock and you know, all of that. So it was like, it made sense that what you hear in December 99 doesn't sound like anything else because I just wasn't, I'm not tuned into anything that's pop, you know. I looked at it like art, you know, which was, I think, was a double edged sword because. People had, because he has such a cult following, you know, people want him to be the 1998 most deaf, you know, that, that has the, uh, the, the beats from Jay Dilla, you know what I'm saying? And I don't compare, I would never compare myself to a Jay Dilla or any of these great producers because that's, they're great at what they do. You know, I happen to be like, I think I'm decent as a person who can make music, but my, my main thing is visual art and it's always been visual art. Um, so that was the experience. I was glad I got to I got to perform at the Tonight Show. You know, uh, I think we made an important piece of music. And you know, now that I'm internationally known as a visual artist, I think the people, uh, whether if I'm here or not, you know, they'll one day revisit that and be like, "You remember when, you know, Ferrari made made an album?" You know, it's like. I think that one day that will be more appreciated than it was when it came out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Definitely. I got to salute you on that project. Like you said, it was different, but it's refreshing. And, man, I could still, yeah. like, the, the production was top-notch is what I want to say, man. So I appreciate you. the work I mean... that y'all did for that project. And it's going to stand at the test of time. And like you say, you, you're going to keep being great, keep creating, but people are always going to want to go back to that project. So that's dope. That yeah, it was, it was a level. special sp special moment in time, you know, um, 2016. You know, we almost, it's going to be 10 years soon. Like, damn, that's crazy. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Now I got to ask you about, um, now I have seen this on your website. Now you done did art exhibits in Paris and Switzerland and Italy. I myself, I never, you know, been to something like that. You see it in the movies and on TV and stuff, but for you to actually have your work in there, you know, what is, what is that like? And, and also doing it, like you say, internationally, going to different continents and having people, you know, come check out your work. Man, I worked my ass off. <laughs> that's you know what I'm saying like I, I can't hold you uh, I was rejected a lot I'm talking about a healthy person a healthy minded person would probably give up you know what I'm saying because uh, I got out of the music industry I, started, I was like I'm, a, I'm gonna make art you know and I figured the only way to be taken seriously is to to, to make the art and do it consistently enlarge and dedicate my life to it. And that's what I did, you know? So it took a lot for me to to break through. Um, and when I broke through, you know, obviously the way the art world works is when something is unfamiliar, first thing that they do is they compare it to something that is familiar. So, you know, I was being compared to Basquiat, Mary Cassette, uh, Monet, everybody, you know, and which gets on an artist's nerve because you, you're like, I'm an individual, you know? Uh, so I had to get through that. It was almost like a, a, a hazing, a hazing period. And uh, I started to see my success and, you know, uh, my financial situation got better. It seemed like overnight, you know, within a year, I was, you know, yeah, I was like really making a lot of money, which to me, you know, I never been materialistic 
per se. I like nice stuff, but uh, the the financial freedom allowed me to expand my ideas and to have less stress because, you know, being a struggling artist, like that actually takes away from your work because you're you're trying to survive. So once that was survival was no longer an issue, uh, I was able to focus more on the work and the work I haven't stopped. You know, it's been five years. I've been going back to back shows, art fairs, art basil, freeze, uh, South Korea, Switzerland. It's just, you know what I mean? So I have a, I'm represented by Massimo Di Carlo, which is based out of uh, Milan in Italy. And in they also have Paris, uh, London, Hong Kong, uh, Beijing. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's amazing, but you know, it's, a, it's a, the only way that I can describe it is that I'm so close to it and I'm so in it. It's hard for me to gauge and just sit back and say, man, you know what, Ferrari, you did, this is amazing. You know, there's been times where I'm in Paris and I'm just like, fuck, I'm like, man, wow, look at what the fuck you're doing, you know, but I'm always looking for, towards the future, you know, so just like right now, I have a, I have a show coming up in New York. Uh, this will be my first solo show in New York, which is crazy because it's almost like the prodigal son has returned. Like, I feel a way about this show because, like, I never got love. Like, the places where you're from, you never get no love. You know what I'm saying? I never got love from New York. I never got love in Chicago, you know? So I'm like, can I please get some love from, you know what I'm saying, hometown? And, um, but I'm excited about it. It's just like, you know, you you spend eight or nine months making these large works or whatever works there are, and then you put them out into the world and then they become immortalized, you know? Um, and they they then belong to the world, you know? Man, that's dope. That is so dope. I mean, because yeah. people dream of, we're going to go to Paris one day, we're going to go to Italy one day, but to be able to do what you love to do, get paid, yeah. travel the world, you know, and, you know, you're making people happy. It's just, it's, it seems like it's just so amazing and rewarding. And also, like you say, this painting took eight or nine months. The average person don't even understand that. They see the finished product. I want to have it. Let me take it home. Hey, I've been working right. on this all year. You know what I'm saying? So I got right. to, you know, put you on that. Yeah, you know, and it gets, it gets extremely complicated the more the value of my work goes up the more expectations there are uh i have sold out every show that i've ever done knock on wood it's like michael jordan you know what i'm saying like michael jordan not comparing myself to mike yes i am i'm comparing myself to michael jordan because i've sold out every show that i've ever done but that means that there's a microscope on any little mistake. Like when Jordan got the ball stole from him that time, it was like, I can't believe he got the ball stolen. Like, look at all the times he didn't get the ball stolen. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I'm being realistic. I'm at the I'm at a point in my career where like I'm still relatively young, especially for a visual artist. And I'm like, you know, how many, you know, do I have 40 more years in me to do this? Uh and, you know, I'm giving myself grace because I know it's like I've done all, I, I've been an overachiever, but I can't expect too much from myself because I'll burn out, you know? And the market doesn't care. Like, they just know that, oh, Ferrari is a hot artist right now. We need more and more work, you know? But it's up to me to turn down some of these these opportunities to put myself first. Because if there's, if I can't, if I'm not able to perform in the way that people expect me to perform, then I'm gonna hurt, I'm gonna be a detriment to myself, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt, man. Self-care is 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 necessary. Self-preservation comes first. Um, we're about 30 minutes in. So I guess my, my, my last question I want to ask you, you had mentioned you got an exhibit coming up in New York. Um, do you have any other exhibits or projects? Um, if the if the viewers want to follow you and check out your work, you got a website, you know, just yeah. let them know what's going on. Yeah, so you can follow me um, at uh, Ferrari Shepard. That's F E R R A R I S H E P P A R D on Instagram. 
Um, and I have my website, ferrarishepherd.com, or you can go to Massimo DiCarlo. You just Google me. Um, but uh, yeah, so the show, so I have the New York show, and I'm pretty excited about it. I'm going to do an artist talk with Angelina Jolie. Uh, she's opened up a... Um, Oh, I shouldn't be saying this because then people might show up. When is this being? <laughs> no, whatever. I don't want, I don't want we, we got security, but whatever, you know. Uh, so I won't say where that's going to be. But, um, you know, then after that, after that show, then I have uh, Hong Kong. So I'm going to do a solo in Hong Kong. Uh, and then all the, the, the usual suspects, Art Basel, um, freeze LA. I mean, not freeze LA, freeze wherever, you know, wherever the gallery tells me they need some work for. But, uh, so you, you guys should look for that. And, um, yeah, man, I hope I inspire you. And to all the kids out there, I want you to know that, uh, you know, anything is possible. Like for sure, you're looking at somebody who comes from the housing projects and, you know, uh, I didn't know if I would have a chance or not. But just never give up. Never give up. And don't listen to any of the haters. Man, I'm, I'm definitely inspired, King. Like I say, I'm still processing a lot of the information that you share um, with me and the viewers. Um, it's definitely been an honor. Um, keep up the great work. I definitely look forward to what you have coming in the future. I know you got a lot more things that you got to do. So, you know, that's what's up, man. I want to thank the thank viewers you. for tuning in. It's been a phenomenal episode of Taiye Speaks. So until next time, family, peace. Peace.